그러면 지금부터 첫 번째 발표 진행하겠습니다. 아, 세계적인 컨설팅 기업이지요. 시장 조사 기관이기도 하고요. 특히나 정보 통신 분야에서 많은 연구를 해 오신 프로스텐 네설리번 APAC의 니출 코리나 님께서 함께 자리를 하고 계시는데요. 아시다시피 이 코로나 님은 특히 아시아 태평양 동아시아 지역의 ICT 산업 전망과 정책 연구를 통한 기업 컨설팅을 해 오고 계십니다. 아마 큰 도움이 되지 않을까라는 생각이 듭니다. I'd like to invite to the stage uh, the director ICT Industry for Stan Sullivan APAC Nishchir Kurana, please welcome him. 큰 박수로 여러분 맞아주시면 감사드리겠습니다. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the president of SPRI and the entire SPRI team for inviting me over for this conference. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to be here, and I love the way the software conferences are changing, right? So I have been uh, fortunate enough to be speaking at a lot of uh, software and IT services conferences over the last decade. But what's most interesting is the way the topics have changed, right? While we started discussions with saying, let's make more packet solutions, can we move away from services to productization, how can we have greater IP around the topics? The conferences around software are now a lot more exciting. They're a lot more about business value. They're a lot more about convergence with different industries. And what makes it most exciting today is to talk about how can we use emerging technologies to create value for the customers, right? And actually, that's what I will spend some time in my presentation as we go forward is to spend time understanding what are our customers really looking for, right? What is the challenge that they're facing that probably software can address? And this will open up an insights to what are the 2017 trends in software and what is the roadmap for us. So to begin with, let's take a step back and understand what our customers are really going through. So there are some trends we call as the mega trends. These are trends which are impacting each and every enterprise globally and forcing them to relook at the way they've done business before. And I'll walk you through just a few of them. Right. The first one is what I call as the shift in the economic balance right, of powers. Now what happens is when your economic powers are shifting. Believe me, in every boardroom today, the biggest discussion is which are the best markets for us. Where do we really need to focus on? Which markets should we export from? Which markets should we import from? And that's because it is a continuous shift in the, the, the powers, right? It's no longer a Western story, right? There's a lot more uh, consum consumption patterns, a lot, a lot more spending capabilities, the uh, higher purchasing power parity in many, many other countries and regions, and continuously uh, products and services players are seeing where they can maximize their businesses from. The next one is about the demographic shifts. A recent United Nations report had said that in 2030 we expect a global population of 1 billion people. 2030. Right. Right. Now the point is if, if by 2030 it, this is the kind of scale we're talking about in terms of population. What, are we, what does it really mean for, for enterprises? Right? What it means is we need to understand the demographic changes and the reason why. Not all countries are growing at the same pace. There are countries which are forced, facing challenges of aging workforce. I work with a lot of clients who, who don't get skill sets, who have an aging workforce. The countries which have a higher portion of millennials the countries which have, uh, do not have the right skill sets. The countries which have a larger women force. And this makes the talent uh, positioning or the way the talent is managed globally very, very different. And companies are spending a lot more time thinking where is the next talent going to come from, depending, of course, on the kind of business they are in. Growth of smart cities, right? Again, a very important mega trend. The reason being, the way companies do operations from, the way they do operations from is going to tr change radically, right? We again talk about some of the leading 
metropolitan cities of the world today going to become, uh, and we estimate that to about 26 of them, going to become smart cities by 2026. Now, what does that mean again for us? It means that we have to appreciate the fact that companies will be operating from newer regions. They will be operating in far more distributed geographies. And this means that we need to relook at how the business strategy is going to be. Rise of the global workforce. And all of us, and classic example that I am here in this room right now, is that all companies today have an increasingly global workforce. They're pulling in talent from different places to, to what best suits the client and the client's needs. Right? It is not about regional geographic decentralization. And finally, the exponential growth of devices. We're talking about 50 billion devices by 2025 or 26 billion devices by 2020. Now, these numbers are astronomical. These are very large figures, right? It is going to completely change the way businesses are going to give products, services to the customers, take feedback, and connect with them. And believe me, even a consulting service company like ours today is looking at how can we digitize, reach out to customers through mobility, how can we leverage connected devices far more. So leave aside manufacturing, which is far more impacted by this whole trend, right? Now, what this means is there is a shift in the way things are happening, the business are going to rechain themselves. But let me share with you an example, and I think you will enjoy this example. I know of one of, a, one of the leading color tube manufacturers. You know, you have the uh, TV cathode ray color tubes in, in televisions, right? It was a leading manufacturer in one of the countries, uh, highest market share, very good stakeholder value, they realized there's a shift coming towards LCD, LED, and plasma TVs. They hired some of the best consultants. They decided to move that path. They actually invested a lot in moving towards the LCD TV. They still realized that there's an untapped television market they were working towards. <coughs> but suddenly, over a period of one year, they, their shareholder value dropped by 90%. They were doing everything right. They were looking futuristic. What went wrong is the pace of change. Today, businesses are stunned and astonished not by mega trends, but the pace of change. And that's making the difference why we see so many such examples and names that we keep talking about, right? We talk about Blockbuster, Borders, who are in the media entertainment company, uh, being uh, completely wiped off by the, the Amazons and the Spotify's. But that's what's happening. It's not only the, the futuristic view, but it is a pace of change which is making all the difference. Which means, on one hand, we have the challenges of mega trends. On the other hand, we have new business models. But this is not it. We have a huge challenge of changing customer expectations. I work with a lot of clients, again, who work on customer experience. And they spend a lot of money and market research to understand what the customers are. So if you bucket them into four broad areas, you will realize customers today are far more informed, right? They take far more informed decisions. They are far more connected. They have access to each other's information. The word of mouth is much stronger. When they make decisions about a product or service purchase, they're able to access a lot more viewpoints before going to the market, right? They're far more tech savvy. That is, when a company makes decisions on customer experience, it has to be the right balance between having technology and physical presence. You cannot, it cannot be one or the either. Right? They're far more tech savvy and they're okay to have a far more technology related customer experience. They believe in the value of experience. Customers today are not only looking for products and services, they're looking, is my experience giving me enough value? And that's the reason why if you see they're willing to give away some of our information. So most of us in this room have given away our, our information to, to web providers and when we log into our access accounts of social media because it gives us personalized services. We get our list of name, we get our friends list, we get our contacts databases because, because it gives us very personalized services and we are ready to compromise on a lot more data to get those kind of services, right? And each, why am I highlighting this? Because if you carefully look, 
for software vendors in this room, each of this is an opportunity. When I say informed and connected, we're talking about social media. When I'm talking about tech savvy customers, I'm talking about IVRs, I'm talking about customer experience through uh, augmented reality. When I'm talking about personalization, I'm talking about a lot more uh, market segmentation, I'm talking about a lot more customer feedback analysis. And when I'm talking about values and experience, I'm talking a lot more about how we actually churn CRM, CEM solutions to be able to give experience. So do you realize each trend is an is a opportunity for each of us in the room? And the last aspect that I'll touch upon from a digital aspect and what companies are going through is about their workforce, right? Now what happens is talent is, is of course one of the critical aspects that every organization manages. But today talent is not about what they have in the office premises. You have an extended enterprise. The, the uh, global sales team is working far more extended out of the premises. People prefer to work from home. As a matter of fact, you, the concept of BYOD has now well established where they get their personal devices home. So, so the enterprise is now beyond the, the typical boundaries of what it was, right? And at the same time, you have the millennial workforce, which is expectations are very different. There's a lot of research happening on the millennial workforce because they expect things which are very different from the conventional workforce. You will have to find new ways Businesses will have to find new ways to engage with them, new ways to overcome their compensation benefit expectations, provide them the total rewards, and a lot more to really overcome their expectations. Now, this is a complex set of things, right? It's, CEO's job today is not easy, but it's awesome and it's great for software providers. Because each of these, as I said, keeps creating opportunities, right? And we're gonna look at some of them and how we really, which one should we select out of these? At the end of the day, the need for businesses is innovation. And software needs to help these companies innovate. I will share with you a few case studies. And what I want to highlight here is that innovation for your clients or customers could mean different things. Different companies are at different stages of innovation, right? And they will need very different solutions from you. To give you an example, of a classic example where in 2014, the US government had asked Tesla and GM to recall certain model of cars, right? This was due to risk of fire in, in certain devices. Now, same situation, two car manufacturers. Look at the difference in which they deal with it. On one hand, you have Tesla. It is able to provide the service or the recall for management for 29,000 cars only because, or only through a software remote diagnostic management. Why? Because they had uh, 3G services and IoT integration already done. And on the other hand, you had GM, which the trucks did not have internet and had to actually work with 380,000 trucks manually. You can imagine the impact on the customer experience. Now this was innovation for Tesla, which is very strategic, but at the same level, you have innovation for different companies which can mean something very different, right? And we keep taking examples of these. You have companies like Uber, you have companies like Airbnb. Are they really uh, transportation companies? Are they hospitality companies? No, they're not. They are big data and technology companies. They have zero inventory, but they're ma managing some of the largest hospitality and uh, transportation companies today, right? And similarly, you have companies like Facebook, you have Netflix, these are all big data companies. The, what I want to highlight from the previous example and this example is that companies need innovation, their innovation expectations could be different, but these are all software-driven opportunities for, for companies and countries. The easiest way to spot opportunities is each of us is working in a particular sector or a particular area. And you will start seeing this digital transformation already, right? In banking, we talk about branchless banking. In utilities, we're talking about smart grids. In IT, we're talking about better knowledge management systems. In the media, we're talking about content management. In retail, we have virtual stores. In healthcare, we're talking about EMR and point of care solutions. And I'm sure since all of us are in this industry, we are all experiencing these opportunities.
But the big question that I typically get asked by software companies is, so what do I really focus on? Right. You're talking so many things. You're giving me so many opportunities. You're talking about so many industries. You're talking about where do I really focus on and how do I really understand what my client really needs? And that's why I like this framework. This framework gives you a simple model and it breaks it down into three basic pieces. It talks about collaboration, boundaryless, and agile. What software companies are expected to do, and this is the core fundamental, is help the clients become more boundaryless, which is help them perform operations in global environments, help them work 24 by 7 through and give seamless customer experience, provide collaboration, which is both inward looking and outward looking, inward looking through employee engagement, through employee surveys, we have a lot of enter enterprise employee applications, outward looking through social media integration, and become of course more agile, which is real time data driven. So this model gives you a good picture of what your customers want at the end of the day. Right. Now, what I have been talking so far is more of the business lens, right? But what we generally con have conversations about in our discussion rooms and strategy rooms is the technology lens. So let's look at how the technology lens is reshaping us, right? And there are some mega trends and drivers in the technology space as well. Some of them that we keep talking about, and they're not new to us in this room, are big data, cloud computing, cybersecurity, 3D printing, autonomous robots, and augmented reality. And each of them itself is now a growing at double digit market growth. Right? And I work with a lot of government agencies across globally. We have spent, they're investing a lot of money in building the skill sets, in getting the ecosystem together, in actually creating innovative solutions. Right? And that's what we need. Let's take some of, the, some of these and go a little deeper into them and understand what these opportunities mean for us. I'll take the first one, which is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has had about 900 plus startups across 66 countries getting a, getting a funding of over 4 billion USD in the last year. I think that speaks for itself. I don't need to speak too much about the importance of, of artificial intelligence with the kind of scale of investment that's happening in that space, right? The first level of what we call artificial intelligence is more domain-centric. And I think that's what we've all been focusing on, right? Which are application-centric or domain-centric. The next level is called more of generic, generic artificial intelligence. And that goes to the even higher level of super, super intelligence. What's happening in each of these intelligence levels if you see you're moving from a domain, you're moving to more robotics, and you are over a period of time trying, trying, trying to get to more human intelligence. And this is not theory. There are enough and more companies doing this, there's enough business opportunity, and again, a double-digit growth for software providers, right? And the interesting part about AI is you may not be able to sell AI standalone. You, but there's a huge opportunity for AI to work with other software vendors, integrate this, because it is something embedded into each and every technology area that's going to come in the going forward, right? So you have to have an analytics and AI strategy in your roadmap for the software that you develop. I'll move to the next area, which is a very hot topic, a topic which is loved by, by most around the world today, which is on the Internet of Things. And why is Internet of Things getting so popular? What this chart just shows you is something very simple. On one axis, it's showing us connected devices. Right? So on one axis, we are seeing connected devices. On the other, we are seeing applications. And if you see the, the how they together come, is a journey of inter Internet of Things. As your device's integration increases, as the number of applications increase, we are moving more and more towards transformational innovation. 
coming back to my point, 50 billion devices integrated by 2025, clearly showing a roadmap of a very connected environment. Right? But the bigger question is why is this so exciting? <clears throat> why do we all love talking about IoT? Right? There are two angles to this. One is the business angle to it. Each and every business today is looking how can it create more value for itself. Each industry looking how can it create more value for itself and differentiate itself by moving into the IoT space. And we talk about classical examples of manufacturing, healthcare, but there are a lot more examples which can go down to much smaller industry segments like agriculture, right? We have examples which talk about even your brewery manufacturing. There are examples in each and every industry which can talk about how IoT has been used effectively to drive this business value for them. But that's the business side of the story. The other side of the story, as I said, is for the software providers or the technology providers. It's an opportunity for the technology ecosystem, right? As your sensor prices are dropping, so there's the one research which showed sensor prices dropping at about 5% year on year between 2015 to 2020. Now, as sensor prices continue to drop, hardware gets more commoditized and cheaper. Networks getting faster from 3G, 4G to 5G, right? You have an opportunity to bring this ecosystem together and create value for the customers. And this is where I've seen some of the best technology vendors being the front runners here. Because you have to ideate. You have to work far more closely with your customer. You have to do a lot more prototyping. But it creates a lot more opportunity for large-scale transformation-led projects. The next example that I want to talk about when I talk about IoT is IoT in standalone, again, is nothing, like we talked about AIT. It's about how you converge these technologies together, right? And a very interesting example is about how the Tyson Group, uh, which is the elevator manufacturer, looked at converging IoT and augmented reality along with analytics. Now, they picked up a trend which says that we will have one of the largest urbanization trends happening globally, which means taller buildings, taller towers, and we need more, more space for lift. But if we grow our lift manufacturing business at the percentage that it's going to grow, we will not be able to have a team, a service team, to cater through this. And we cannot disappoint our customers and customer experience. So what do we do? That's when the technology played a role. They said, we are going to use technology to manage preventive maintenance. They had IoT connected devices, which gave them information at the central repository of data where they could remotely diagnose all the lifts operating, and they have the capability now to actually reduce 20% of the errors and a far more sophisticated preventive maintenance system through their uh, technology system. And this is not only in, in lift manufacturing. I'm, I can give you examples in automotive, right? We see a lot more remote diagnostic coming in automotive. You have co sensor companies like Bosch working with the Audis and working with the BMWs and many other manufacturers to actually create remote diagnostic for all the vehicles. And that's a trend which is going to happen. Again, a classic example of convergence of I IoT with other technologies. So as Sir just touched earlier on the GE example, right? And I want to touch on this too. Because the point is, who is going to monetize this opportunity? We're talking about the IoT opportunity, but who is going to really make money out of it? All of us in this room have competition from companies which are not software vendors, but companies who have already done good implementations. And a classic example, again, is GE. GE has decided to move as a digital industrial company. As part of the strategy, they already have a 15 billion software business plan for 2020. Now, that's a huge opportunity, right? Now, the way they have done it is they have divided the digital strategy into three parts. The first, GE for GE. Can I make solutions for my company itself? Wherein they have connected devices. Uh, sorry, I can see some of us flipping through the pages. I think this, this diagram is there in one of, the, one of the later slides, so you do not need to take pictures. You will get access to that. So GE for GE talks about how GE will integrate uh, or, or 
take data, real-time data, metrics, KPIs from the production machines to the central repository, have an analytic system which can ma uh, help them ma manage their assets, which can help them manage the production, which can help them manage the operations. So, so this is the GE strategy for their own GE for GE story. The other story that they have is the GE for customers. They said that if we're doing this for ourselves, why cannot we productize this? Clear competition for us in the room, right? GE says, we're going to create applications. We're going to create applications for customers, applications for suppliers. And finally, the model of IoT, which is going to succeed, is the GE for the world, which is platform-centric. The success of IoT is going to be a lot about platforms, right? And that's why they have created the Predix platform, which says, you buy a platform, and you can build applications on it. You can customize to yourself. And that's where we see the world heading. So as software leaders, you will need to think about how can you either collaborate with platform vendors or actually move the platform way. My last part on before I move the, uh, to the next section is about infrastructure. And the reason I'm touching upon this is because for software vendors, it is important to note that even the IT infrastructure is going a radical change, creating immense opportunities, right? So we are talking about almost 30% plus growth in the IAAS space, right? Infrastructure as a service. We are talking about a growth of almost 12% plus in the, in the data center co-location market. What I want to highlight here is that our outsourcing of infrastructure models are far more mature. The cloud infrastructure model continues to get more mature. At the same time, given the IoT, given the big data, given the analytics, you're going to have a lot more in-house infrastructure as well, right? The hybrid models. And to manage that, companies realize they cannot be locked into a single customer. They cannot be locked into a single technology. They need more flexibility in IT infrastructure. And that's where we have the next trend that I want to talk about is the software-defined data center. Right. And that's where we see opportunities coming in for compute, storage, and networking. These take software-defined infrastructures helping customers by delocking or decoupling the manufacturers from the software vendors. It is helping give them more agility. And as a matter of fact, I can share with you, we, we are working with some of the larger countries and companies who are building a roadmap for the software-defined infrastructure, because that's a phenomenal opportunity going forward. Now, this is an interesting one. We kept talking about IoT, cloud. What does it mean for us? Is also another opportunity called security. The moment we have software installed, we have networking, we have internet, we have the risk of cyber threats. And we have seen enough examples around IoT-based automotive hacking, internet-based traffic light hacking, public cloud hacking, as well as hacking which comes in IoT-connected homes. As a matter of fact, uh, we did a very recent research in Asia Pacific with some of the leading CIOs. And 64% of CIOs even today say that we are not confident on moving to cloud because of security threats. Now, what does it mean for opportunities? One, better technology solutions, yes. But the biggest trend we see here is a trend of managed security, where vendors are walking up with software solutions to the customers and saying, we not only have a software, but we will implement your processes, we will implement your policies, and we will look at the human resources. And we will give you a managed security model. Again, a model which is taking up needs collaboration. In the interest of time, to sum up what I just said, right? I'm talking about digital transformation. I'm talking about big data and analytics. I'm talking about Internet of Things, cloud computing, and security solutions. So if you see, these are the top trends in 2017 we expect. These are the top opportunities in 2017 we expect to take forward. But as we were having a conversation over lunch, the biggest challenge will happen in this room is which of these should I pursue? Which of these should I let go? 
and how do I go after them, right? That's, that's a challenge now. It's not about where. It's about how do I pick up my opportunities and how do I go after them. And that's why I like to share two simple models with you. The first model we call as an innovation engine. What it does is very simply, it talks about you need to know which geography you're going to play in. You need to look at which industries you're strong at right now and you can play in. Functions that you can reach out to where you have strength, you have access, you have connects. The tech clusters. And then look at what mega trends and business models that you want to create. And if you look at this grid carefully, you'll be able to identify opportunities for yourself. So you may want to put up a think tank in your organization, sit together, look at these five, six parameters, and actually focus down on what are the areas you want to focus on and how are you going to go after. And a simple model to close that with is what we call as an A, B, C, D model. You will need to look at the applications. We have to be very clear in terms of strategy. We see large traditional software vendors globally now looking at a strategy which is cloud-based. They're actually investing a lot of money on cloud. Right? You see a lot of startups who will be competition to you, who are innovative. You may want to look at how do you partner with them on applications, or how do you probably acquire them if you're a larger company. Business users. You need to reach out to business users. It's very interesting. The role that business users play in software decision making today is much larger. And our research showed us that 95 to 97 percent business users even today, do not understand what cloud computing difference between private and public is. So the, creating the awareness for your technology and solution and software will also be your job with the right business users. Involve your customers. Work with your customers to co-create solutions. Do not create a product and take it to the market. Co-creation is the model of the future. Work with the customers. Look at how you can give him licensing models. Look at how you can use subscription-based models. Look at, I, I have enough examples of companies who've created licensing models which are better tied to the business need and industry rather than generic. And they have been the ones who've succeeded very well, right? So look at your licensing model for your customers. And finally, ensure that whatever technology solution you talked about, you have the right security and analytic solution as a part of your value proposition. Do not miss those two elements out. So I will, I will close my presentation here. Uh, I will be open for more discussion later. But thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.